Hi Rovers, I hope you're all having a very happy Monday. Today we're going to start off our Mental Health Week, which is going to be part of National Alzheimer's Awareness Month, as well as National PTSD Awareness Month. This week we're going to be going over all kinds of topics, such as COVID-19 related grief, how to deal uh, with grief related from the death of a loved one, uh, advice for caregivers and those helping those with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, and lots of other stuff to help with your mental health during these troubling times. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy learning along with us as always. Hi, I'm John Saunders. Take a quick look around the room. Whether you're with family, coworkers, or in a room full of strangers, someone around you is dealing with a mental health issue. They are living silently, but dealing with an issue that affects their lives and others. Mental illness, despite its seriousness, can be looked at through judgmental eyes for many people. Pull yourself together, suck it up, don't worry about it, are things said even by loved ones. Those well-meaning people who don't understand, it's not as simple as cheering up. Asking a person suffering to move on is like asking a person with a broken leg to run a marathon. You wouldn't tell someone who can't walk to get out of bed. What is needed is understanding and help. And there is help. Tell your family, tell a friend, and just as important, tell your doctor. He or she will be determined to get you the right person to change your life. Don't hide behind a mask that allows others to believe everything is fine. Talking about your issues will first relieve the isolation, but allow your support system to grow. Getting the understanding you need and the help that is available begins with you stepping out of the shadows of fear and giving them a chance to help. Not only should you talk about it, you need to talk about it. My own sister hit her pain by substituting things she thought we could handle. Things she wasn't ashamed to tell doctors, not the things she needed to tell us. We must, as a society, learn to recognize the signs and reach out to those we know are in trouble. Turning our heads or trying to be a cheerleader to snap someone out of it can end in tragedy. It doesn't have to. Be the one who reaches out to save someone, or maybe it's you. Be the one to save yourself. everybody. My name is Amy Stapleton. I'm the manager of bereavement services at the Chesapeake Life Center Hospice of the Chesapeake. I'm also a licensed professional counselor. I'm here to talk with you just a little bit today about some of the challenges that, that we're feeling during this time of COVID-19. Something that we all know is very present in our world today is grief. Time and time again, we hear as we look at the news, read the newspaper, or maybe scroll through our news feed online, that people are indeed dying, many of them members of the aging population. That is no doubt grief. And yet, there may be other feelings that accompany this time that are also grief, that that sometimes even go unnamed or unexpressed. I wanna specifically say that today, it is important that we not minimize the very real deaths that have occurred, especially the impact of COVID-19 on the aging population. We know the statistics, we know who is most vulnerable, and yet there comes a very real grief with that of not knowing what the future holds, a fear that um, maybe many of you have faced around being unsure what's safe or if you've been exposed or how to keep yourself safe. And there's certainly with this time comes a loss of control, a loss of so much, um, a loss of choice around when and where to go to the grocery store or, 
or a loss of being able to connect with others. So know that what you're feeling is real and valid. And especially for the aging population, this is not just something that shows up as a statistic, but this is something real and valid that many of you are encountering um, and that we talk about here at the Chesapeake Life Center as grief. Two types of grief that I want to specify today and, and share a little more with you about um, are anticipatory grief and secondary losses. So anticipatory grief is when we anticipate a death or a transition or a loss, but we don't know when it's going to happen. And that can often lead us to, to kind of be in this heightened state of worry or fear and anxiety of, of imagining what's going to happen or what it would be like, but really not knowing. And that feels very true for us today as we navigate COVID-19. When's it going to end? What's it going to be like? What will this new normal be? How will things be different? Secondary losses that are very real and present to us these days are, are the losses beyond kind of a, a physical death or loss or transition. They're the, the ripple effect, if you will, that accompany a loss. And secondary losses sometimes get minimized because, you know, it's not the original loss or death that that we're grieving, it's, it's the ones that accompany it. So these days during COVID-19, those secondary losses can really be um, big, like not being able to say goodbye to friends before they move or not being able to help people when they're sick in our community, like we would traditionally bring over soup. Um, they can also mean a loss of community, like not connecting with others for our, our weekly um, game night or not being able to see family and friends like we had hoped. Those are very real losses and we, um, we wanna take time to acknowledge those. So what helps? First, as you think about coping with COVID-19, I would invite you to think about connecting with others and that's, more challenging these days and yet so much is open to us in terms of technology so there's ways in using computers and um, you know conference call lines and uh, game nights on the computers now via zoom lots of opportunities to connect with others i just today read an article about a group at a senior center in New York that's doing a comedy class online. I thought that was such a great idea just to be able to laugh together. So connecting with others however you can, you know, it's, it's still okay to write a note or a letter and put it in the mail. That does make a difference. The other thing that um, I personally find helpful is focusing on gratitude. Now, gratitude and grief is kind of a tricky thing. Um, I, I wouldn't start off there and certainly, you know, people say to me all the time that I sit within the counseling room after an incredible loss, they will say to me, I don't like the idea that I have to go through this to grow or be grateful. Um, I'm certainly not saying that here today. And yet I find time and time again, even when things are incredibly hard, that people can find something to be grateful for. So one of the practices that, that I often work with clients in using is kind of adapting the practice of journaling or even meditation or prayer if you're not comfortable writing it down. But thinking of three things every day um, that you're grateful for. And writing those down is always helpful, but if not, again, maybe thinking of them first thing when you wake up in the morning or last thing before bed. Um, I like to think of it as a something I'm thankful for, maybe something that um, surprised me during the day, something that brought me joy, 
um, and maybe even something that I need help with or that I felt help and support in navigating. So music, uh, poetry, there are a lot of great guided imageries right now on YouTube, um, gentle yoga, lots of resources out there. So even when things are hard, um, please know that there's help. So thank you for taking the time today. I really wanna again acknowledge all that you're feeling, all that you're experiencing in the world as we navigate COVID-19 together. And I'm grateful for you. Take good care. Hello, I'm Demi Lovato. One of the most exciting things about becoming a young adult is that you start to have a say in your life. Where you live, where you work, what you do. Unfortunately, it's hard to feel in control when your life feels out of control. That's what it felt for me when I was going through my dark period. I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I was hurting myself. I was anorexic and bulimic. I wasn't doing well. But it took my parents and my team to pull me aside to talk to me about getting help. What I experience may not be exactly what you experience, but for every young adult out there who feels scared or sad or out of control, who feels like their mental health diagnosis means they're unworthy, I wanna let you know that you are, that your life has meaning. You can reach out to someone you trust and be there for you. I want you to know that you can overcome and get through anything. I know where you've been and I know where you're going it can be really magical. People are living much longer, and a common consequence of aging is loss of thinking skills. There's no clear line between what's sort of normal loss of thinking skills and disease. Being able to systematically study that makes it a little bit more challenging. There's a great amount of noise, a great amount of misunderstanding out in the world about what the causes are of dementia, and more importantly, what you can do to prevent it. In 2015, four to five million adults in the United States were suffering from dementia, costing more than $200 billion. As the population grows and people live longer, the number of people with dementia will increase. When people become impaired, it doesn't just affect them, it affects everybody around them. Their families have to take care of them. This has enormous effects on the whole society in ways that lots of other diseases don't. The National Institute on Aging at NIH asked the National Academies to convene a committee of experts to evaluate the latest research on how to protect cognitive health. The committee looked at studies on three types of conditions, age-related cognitive decline, which can be a normal part of aging, mild cognitive impairment, in which a person shows more notable problems but can adapt and live independently, and clinical Alzheimer's type dementia, in which someone can no longer function independently. This includes Alzheimer's disease, which is the leading cause of dementia, and other diseases with similar symptoms. When people are developing mild problems, we ask about things like how often they're forgetting appointments, how often they're misplacing things, how often they're having trouble paying their bills. When a disease progresses to the point where someone has dementia, then the forgetting is not mild like that anymore. Then people have trouble remembering something from minute to minute, and sometimes from second to second. Cognitive decline and dementia progress slowly, and damage in the brain often begins a decade or more before any symptoms show up. For a while, the brain can adapt, which can mask the early stages of the disease. But by the time someone starts exhibiting symptoms, damage in the brain could be extensive. So long before someone has trouble remembering names, getting lost driving in a car, there will have been detectable changes in the brain that then progress and lead to dementia. Researchers are actively investigating treatments for dementia, but the best possible solution is to prevent the disease altogether. When nerve cells die in the brain, we don't have any way of rejuvenating them. So the notion is that if you can intervene really early, then you might be able to prevent that process. 
Through their review, the National Academies Committee did not find any interventions that were shown to definitively prevent cognitive decline or dementia. The committee did identify three interventions where the evidence was encouraging but inconclusive. Encouraging but inconclusive evidence, and those words are important. If you engage in these three activities, which by the way are good for you anyway, then at a minimum we can say they might help. One intervention is cognitive training, which includes an array of exercises aimed at enhancing problem solving, memory, and speed of processing. Many people assume that that cognitive training means computer-based brain games. It's a much more complicated intervention than just sitting at the computer by yourself. There is no evidence, in fact, that the computer-based brain games actually make a difference. A second intervention is managing high blood pressure in people with hypertension. This could be accomplished through taking blood pressure management medications and sometimes through lifestyle interventions such as diet and exercise. Several studies show a connection between controlling high blood pressure in midlife and reducing risk of dementia later. A hypertension is an insidious disease. Many people who are hypertensive don't know it. What's important is that you don't try to control it in someone who is 70 for the first time, but it needs to be done in middle age because that's when the brain changes. A third intervention is being physically active. For example, increasing aerobic exercise and strength training. That just means doing more than what you currently do. It doesn't mean going out to join a gym or to start doing weightlifting or anything like that. It just means that if you are a person who's pretty sedentary, then you can start by just simply walking. We know that over short periods of time in clinical trials, physical activity actually appears to show cognitive benefit. And we also know that there are changes in the brain that we can measure, like on magnetic resonance imaging scans. Managing your blood pressure, physical exercise, it's good for you. Cognitive training won't hurt you, and it looks like it may help you. To know for sure if these interventions prevent cognitive decline and dementia, more research is needed. The National Academies Committee also recommends a number of ways to improve future studies. One area of focus is enhancing our ability to understand and predict disease progression. So sometimes we might be using a scan of some sort that tells us about the structure of the brain, that tells us about the proteins in the brain, to try to get a really good prediction of what's gonna to happen to somebody in 10 years or in five years. At present, a lot of research on cognitive decline and dementia falls short because studies don't follow people for long enough or look at a broad range of the population. Do you have to follow people for a very long time in order to see if you've made a real difference? The standard clinical trial for patients with Alzheimer's disease might be 18 months. For people with mild cognitive impairment, might be three years but a lot of these changes take much longer than that to progress and so we don't have a lot of studies that have followed people with interventions for long periods of time. We need to go out to the community and get people who don't really come to the hospital, you know, different kinds of occupations and get them involved in research so that we can see how these interventions work across different populations. We want to be able to inform the public about what they can do to prevent cognitive decline and live long, healthy lives. That's really what we care about. Learn more and download the full report at nationalacademies.org slash dementia.